to the Pursuit of Growth show, where we hold candid conversations with fascinating individuals from all walks of life to learn about their passions, successes, failures, lessons learned, and how they apply personal growth to their lives. We end every conversation with key takeaways that we can all implement to better ourselves and the lives of those around us. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, my good buddy, my co-author, Greg. How's it going tonight, man? Man, it's going well. And Sammy, as always, we've got an incredible guest tonight. We are joined by an individual that I think is going to share a fascinating story with us today. A guy that I've known for many, many decades, Matt Dominguez. Matt, how you doing, my friend? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Super psyched to be here today, guys. Man, we are super excited to have you. And uh, for those of people watching at home, Matt Dominguez, our guest, attended Sam Houston State on a scholarship where he was the team's MVP in the school's first NCAA Division I AA All-American. He still holds eight Sam Houston State records and five Southland Football League records. In 2005, Matt was inducted into the Sam Houston State Hall of Fame. After college, Matt was a member of the Denver Broncos and his professional football career took him to the CFL where he starred for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, becoming a fan favorite for six seasons. He retired from football in 2008. Matt's faced challenges and adversities on the field. However, he has not lost his faith, and he continues to see all the good that God is doing in his life. Matt met his wife, Jennifer, at St. Houston State University and was married in 2003 in Austin, Texas. Matt, Jennifer, and their three children, Matthew, Victoria, and Marcel, now live in Frisco, Texas. Once again, Matt, welcome to the Pursuit of Growth show. Awesome, man. Awesome. That's that I couldn't have said it about better myself, Greg. Well, you know what? I spent about an hour and a half writing that, so it would just come across <laughs> perfectly. So I'm very proud of, of that introduction. Awesome. I mean, just jumping right into things. When you moved to Canada to play pro football, I'm curious, what were some of the most glaring cultural differences? that you initially noticed in Canada versus your time here in the United States? Yeah, it's crazy because, so um, playing for the, the Rough Riders, um, you know, there is, the, you know, it's in Saskatchewan, so it's right above North Dakota, right? And so uh, it's in the middle of Canada and it's literally um, like the coldest place in the world, okay? <laughs> when it's cold, it is cold. And you can't fathom that because if you've never lived through it, you don't really, understand how cold it can be. Uh, one of the things that, um, you know, culturally there, there was a, a change for me was um, uh, because because of that, because of snowshoes, because of farming, um, years ago, uh, uh, culturally, you, you when you go in somebody's house, you take off your shoes. And so um, I had to get used to taking off shoes and going into people's houses, which now I still do. I still, we still do that now here in Frisco. Somebody comes to my house, you gotta take off your shoes, dude. Um, <laughs> I, I had to, I actually had to like uh, research, you know, the reasons why, you know how much stuff is on your shoes that you just track all into your house? Like go to a gas station, all that stuff is walking around. It's so gross, right? You think about it like that, it's so yeah. gross. So that's that's one of the things. Um, uh, then the money, you know, uh, you know, that's, it's not there. It's not American dollars, Canadian, Canadian money, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a, a $1, uh, it's a coin, it's called a loony. And there's a two dollar coin. It's called a toonie, right? And so the first time my wife and I were were um, um, stopped to get food, um, you know, all I had was American money. And so they broke my cash with Canadian money, and I had all these coins. And I was like, "What the hell is all these? What is all these <laughs> coins for, man?" Wow. Uh, oh, sir, this is a loonie or this toonie. I had no idea, no idea. And then. It's a loony and a toonie. All I knew for that was like cartoons, right? Like <laughs> cartoons, right? Yeah. Right. So it's actually something. So a few of those things I had to really, really get used to. Um, and of course, like I said, of course, the weather. The weather is nothing like Texas. It's it's nothing like it. You, you said know, it's like the coldest place on earth. How cold does yeah. it get there in the winter time? Oh, so so one of the things one of the things that um, um, one of the misconceptions about Canada is like it's cold all the time. It's not cold yeah. all the time. All right. They have a, they, 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 it's just that when it is cold, it is cold. Okay. Um, you know, from let's say, you know, December, so l late November, December, you know, January, February, that time of the year, it is the coldest place ever. It's so cold. Like you'll get, um, your, your eyelashes will start to, to, to freeze up together. 
Mm. Um, your pants, if you're not wearing ski stuff on, your pants will get super duper crispy, like they can walk themselves. Really? Yeah. <laughs> if you don't have a, a car heater, for the most part, a, a, an engine block heater, for the most part, your your engine's gonna, your, your, your car won't start. And so, like, imagine every place you go, there's a, um, a, a little kiosk outside where you can charge your car uh, to keep it warm because it's yeah. so cold. Um, but once again, that's only a three or four, four um, months out of the year in Saskatchewan. There's other places in Canada that they don't get nearly as bad in terms of um, in terms of the weather. I think I read somewhere online and like at some points it can get to like minus like 40 or something like oh. that. Is that right? Oh, my goodness. Literally, literally one day. Well, we, I, so I lived there 15 years. One day it was the coldest place in the world. Meaning it was colder than Antarctica, it's colder than North, North Pole. It was the coldest place in the world. It's just the wind blew through and it was so, so cold that you couldn't go anywhere. Like you had to stay home. And the, you know, I always tell people like, it's, it's super duper cold, but it's only cold from your car to the building. You're, you're going mm -hmm. like, you're not going to be outside at minus 30. You're not. Uh, it's like uh, here when you know it's 115 you're probably not going to hang out outside too much right mm -hmm. and so but but i i can't tell you, I, you unless you have lived through it you cannot fathom what that feels like and the wind blowing and the wind blowing through oh it's the worst that was the only thing that we had to compare to i think you know i've been skiing and that kind of stuff and you know in, in colorado and, and some other places but when we had our big texas freeze earlier yeah. this year when it was like i think it was colder here than it was like in alaska and like yeah. that was like minus two right and yeah. minus two was crazy so i can't yeah, even it, imagine that it was ridiculous because you know we had just moved back mm. and so <laughs> so we had just moved back thought we left all that there and now we're living in a place that uh, that doesn't have infrastructure apparently right. and and wasn't prepared and so i'm you know i just had a house that was totally insulated and could withstand minus 40 and i'm now in a house where we were lost power we lost water uh we had blackouts periodically mm. all because we don't have the infrastructure for it and i thought you know you know we moved to texas we don't have to worry about <laughs> worry about that anymore and I had a whole week of it this is the worst yeah i remember that i mean just uh, just even i grew up in south texas where it's always hot uh, yeah. and it's always muggy yeah to, to feel that was a totally different experience and you're right. We were not ready at all for that. Well, you know, I tell people that you know we actually we actually didn't have it that bad. Right. Um, we could have our power was at that time our power was pretty predictable. So we would get power like for an hour, and then be off an hour, and then be on an hour. So mm. so compared to lots of people who totally lost everything in terms of, terms of power, water, that kind of thing, we actually did okay. It was just ironic that the first time we come back we moved back to Texas that a storm that hadn't hit Texas in 40 years finally shows up. Just crazy. Right. Yeah. Matt, what, what was food like in Canada? Like I can imagine there probably wasn't a whole lot of good Mexican food in Saskatchewan. <laughs> Dude, it's, it's crazy because like a Mexican food spot would pop up and then it wouldn't last very long mm. uh, because winter's coming. <laughs> like like <laughs> you're not going to go sit on a deck and have margaritas. And it's negative 30, right? Like right. nobody wants the, uh, chips and salsa and it's negative 30 outside in Christmas time. Like nobody's going to do that. Right. So, so, you know, they would, they would pop up and they'd be gone. Um, food was okay. The, the, the first thing that I noticed, um, Saskatchewan, I, you know, I, I know that I'm probably going to reference Canada, but I'm really talking about Saskatchewan. Like I said, different parts of Canada is just like different parts of the U S right. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, <clears throat> but in Saskatchewan, one of the fattest things I ever saw. And, and I partook in, um, went to the movies, first movies, and I'm looking over a guy on my left here. He's got this big, fat plate of fries and cheese and gravy. Mm. And I'm like, the hell is this guy eating? <laughs> yeah. This is the fattest thing ever. It's like 4,000 calories. <laughs> and uh, find out it's called poutine. And you can put all kinds of stuff on it. You can put barbecue. You can put brisket. They put chicken. Um, every, anything you think of, they put it on there and just, it's French fries with cheese and gravy and just eating it. <laughs> and, you, and you just throw whatever meat you want on there. Whatever you want on it. So, uh, in terms of, in terms of everything else, it's like any other country that has imported, um, uh, imported, uh, um, music, food, like 
you, you're going to have the pockets. Um, you're going to have the pockets where, you know, there's this Greek area, these, these uh, really good memories was an awesome place for Greek guys, awesome restaurant. Uh, but you're going to have a steakhouse, your steak area. You're going to have those types of things always. Um, but uh, it, I, I missed Texas food all the time. That was one of the main, outside of my family, the culture that I missed was the food, was the food yeah. here. And now I put on 15 pounds moving back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, uh, I, I've only... I've heard about poutine before. I've had some friends that uh, lived up there and they, they said the same thing. They're like, I don't think I really wanted to try it because I was afraid that I was just going to just fall over and die right then whenever I ate it. Yeah, straight clogged arteries, man. <laughs> they actually asked me, do you want gravy? Like I ordered fries one time. They asked me, said, do you want gravy? And I said, yes, because I figured it was the white gravy. It was not the white gravy. It was uh, the brown gravy. Right. Brown, brown gravy is terrible just on regular fries, in my opinion. but. <laughs> Once they start adding the cheese in there, I'm going to say I'm going to have to endorse it. Right. What was it like for you when people found out that you were from Texas? Like, did you get the whole, like, did you ride a horse to school? Oh, man. Oh, yeah. What was yeah. that like? Well, well, just like when I tell people I live in Canada, I lived in Canada there. Did you live in an igloo? Was it cold? Mm. All the, all your, is everybody, is everybody saying? Same boot? questions we're asking you. Yeah. The, well, it's the exact <laughs> same. It's the exact same. It's just the other way. Right. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. Did I live on a ranch? Do I have horses? Like stuff like that, which is to me, it was it's it's like what are we doing as a society where everything comes from the TV, everything yeah. comes from from um, you know the movies, right? Like I did, I lived nowhere near a ranch. I grew up nowhere near <laughs> nowhere near a ranch. I lived in the middle of Georgetown, Texas. There's nothing. There was nothing like that. Um, I, nothing about me says country guy, right? I just live in the country, but I didn't grow up, you know, in the extended you know prairie land. Uh, and have cattle and, and none of those things, right? Um, uh, what we find though is that you know the Canadian football team has to be um, fifty one percent Canadian. So the other percentage, the uh, the other percentage is our Americans, right? So there was dudes from Dallas, from Houston. I had dudes from from Texas on my team, from Oklahoma on my team. Huh. And so of course you you get there's a bit of a kinship when someone's from your home state, right? Um, and, uh, and even from the same conference, football conference that, that I played in. Uh, so, you know, there was some guys, that I always hung out with some of the American guys and and uh, it was cool that way because you were never you were never too far away from people. You know, there was a, uh, an article that I read that talked about the most common question asked to Texans when they travel in Europe mm -hmm. is, have you been to South Fork Ranch? Do you know about JR from the sitcom Dallas? Now that's a TV show that has not been on TV for like 30 years. Mm -hmm. Years. It's still, it's still the most common question asked when someone says they're from Texas. They're like, oh, yeah. Dallas TV show. Who shot Jr. Yeah. Like, that's mind blowing. Yeah. My first my first year was 2003, and yeah, some one of the uh, one of the trainers referenced um, who shot Jr. Mm. I thought <laughs> I, I I I thought that was the dumbest thing because I had no idea what the hell they're talking about. Somebody <laughs> got shot, and because I didn't ever watch Dallas, that was not something that I watched. Right. But I had to be aware now because it's uh it was the TV show that they the Canadians were 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 aware of and watching. But I think it was more of the ageism. Mm -hmm. the, you know the the guy that was making making that reference was a little older than me. They would probably have watched Dallas. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I got the same thing. I went to Sweden in 2019, and I got the same thing. People found out that we were from Dallas, or you know lived in Dallas. And same thing. The who shot Jr. I was like, I yeah. didn't watch the show. I was like, I guess I got to go back and watch the show. I had a guy nudge me one time. He's like, Cowboys, right? Cowboys. <laughs> <laughs> so what was Matt, What was TV like in yeah. Canada? So so they have like, you know, there, there's there's of It's just like here in the sense of you know, there's a a local you know conglomerate of of channels, and then there's all these other channels you can have, right? And so the local conglomerate of channels, um, um, you know, they had to have Canadian content, right? Because you can't just stream everything from the U.S. A bunch of Canadian content um, because they wouldn't be called Canadian channels, right? They would be local channels if they all they did was stream stuff from New York and California, wherever, right? And so uh, it was, I got to tell you, man, we're a little more violent here in the U.S. I didn't say a lot. I'm just saying we're a little more violent here because 
some of the Canadian shows were a little way more chill than they are than what you're going to see out here. Not all of them, not all of them. I don't want to broad brush it too much, but um, you know, CBC and some of these some of these places were much more chill with their content than than what we see every day. And now now since I've moved back here, everybody's got like five different apps that they use. We live stream Netflix and whatever. So, we're not really watching it like that anymore. But um yeah, I I was happy to be on CBC. I was happy to be on TSN. TSN is like um, like ESPN. One of the issues that I always had with it was TSN, which is the ESPN equivalent there, is like 70% hockey. Mm. It's like this, I don't give a crap about hockey, but they everything that you can think of with hockey, that's on there. So trades and psychology mm -hmm. and goal scores and historical events and you know, the minor league, like it's prevalent. And then, it, then everything else is minimal. Everything else yeah. is minimal. We're going to fit everything else into this portion of it. Mm. Yeah. Or the Raptors, actually, you know, the Raptors are good. So the Raptors were good, especially at the time. So the Raptors got a bigger share. They got a bigger share of it. But if it wasn't hockey, it wasn't Raptors. We weren't hearing too much of it. Man, no, no offense to my friends at the Dallas Stars, but as a child, there was nothing that got me to turn away from ESPN quicker than when NHL highlights came on. <laughs> it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate, but it's the truth. And there, it's the exact opposite. They don't even turn it on until the hockey stuff's on. Yeah. Like, it's the exact, exact opposite, man. It's just, it's just that their, their, um, you know, their national sport is hockey. That's just yeah. what it is. And they're, they're really, they're really ticked off, Greg, that, that they haven't had the Stanley Cup there. They haven't yeah. won it there in forever. Mm -hmm. It's always won by a, a U.S. Um, um, team. Now that team is going to be full of Canadians, right? But, but it's here, right? It's going to—it's here. They don't—they don't like that at all. Well, well, Matt. One thing that you don't know about Sam and I is that we're actually big fans of Canadian TV and especially Canadian sitcoms. And so, uh, Sammy, do you have something <laughs> you may want to share with Matt? Yeah. So, so I've got to share my screen real quick. Just okay. All right. I'm try, over there. try something real quick. Um, all right. Let me know when you can see my screen. Now we don't know. Oh, yeah. We've never done this before. If, if the audience can can see this, but we're gonna play you a little clip real quick. Yeah, this is one of my favorite shows called Corner Gas yeah. um, from from Canada, and I just thought maybe we'd we'd listen to about two minutes of this show and just kind of see where it takes us. Sure, sure. Let's see where it takes us. I'm thinking of making a little guacamole and sour cream dip. You get it? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I'd nosh on that action. Oh, sorry, I thought we only did that after one of us said no doubt. Notice no laugh track. Oh, yeah. Yes, no laugh track. No laugh track. Are you mocking us? No, no mocking you. I'm one of you. No, you aren't. Are there mirrors on your planet? Who are you? The Green Goblin? The Green Goblin looks nothing like this. I'm Saskaman, Super Rider fan. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. Uh, who is this? Retire after I feed these two. Hey guys, Riders are gonna win tonight. Oh, are you fans? They play for the Riders. Oh, right. <laughs> that is what I was saying. That was just a little fan. Wow. Here. <laughs> <That's it. laughs> Jeez. Whoa, Gene Makowski and Matt Dominguez. Yeah, and you know what else? Whoa. What are you guys doing? Well, they probably came to see their biggest fan, right? Word probably got out that there was a huge. <laughs> came to see me for themselves. Actually, we were just looking for some coffee. Quite the get up though. She has pretty lame. Give him the Emmy. That's pretty cool. Done. You're yeah. like down from Saskatchewan. Like yeah. a Saskatchewan man. You're like Saska guy. Saska man. No, Saska guy. Don't always get Saska guy. See, <laughs> laugh track would have been perfect there. Oh, man, it'd be perfect right there. <laughs> that was hilarious. We should be laughing. Dude. Uh, Actually, I get one oh, man. Oh. Really like to take hey, so that... <laughs> that right there took I was there eight hours alright <laughs> that that right there took eight hours to. I think I was on film I was on TV like 22 seconds or something stupid like that it was there eight hours and and to this day every year I get 23 cents I'm just saying <laughs> you I'm get a saying, roll. you get that mailbox money. money right that's yeah, what we're all trying to be right there that's amazing. I wonder I wonder how many cents we just contributed by 
showcasing this to our audience, <laughs> our audience and, and watching that. Brett Butt, so Saskaman, uh, uh, Brett Butt there is, um, um, at the time, was one of the top co comedians, right? Mm -hmm. and especially in Canada. He's, he's the guy. And um, the direction that I got from the director, they actually cut the hilarious, one of the most hilarious thing about, they actually cut was that the direction I got from the uh, director was, just act like you would with when you saw a, a regular fan. And I said, okay, cool. So at the very end there, we're walking past him. That whole thing happened and we're walking past him, but he got too close to me. And so I patted him on the head as I, <laughs> then we walked by him, right? Yeah, you laughed, right? Yeah. So the director says, cut, everybody starts laughing. Everybody starts laughing, all right? I thought that was gonna make, cause I thought that shit would be funny. Yeah. And they cut it, they cut it. Cause he didn't want it. <laughs> Uh, he didn't want man. it in there. He didn't uh, want it in there. He didn't want it in there. So was that show a pretty big show? Because when we were oh, researching yeah. beforehand yeah. and we read like the synopsis of the show, like yeah. apparently it was a big deal. It, that show was a huge show there. It was like in the in the Canadian culture, especially in Saskatchewan, because that that uh, that fake town that that show was in was supposed to be like twenty miles from where we were where we were living. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friend there, Gino uh, Mikowski, um, um, uh, you know, he's a Hall of Famer. Like, he's oh, literally wow. a Hall of Fame uh, tackle. And for my five years that I, lit, I I played there, in the huddle, he was always to my left. He was always right here next to me. So for five years, and his kids are my age, like my kids' age. And so it was cool to be be there with him. He's now like a political figure there now. Like He's like a senator or something crazy. He's like almost a senator there now. But um, so you have you have him as a as a he's Canadian and he's Canadian. So you have him, uh, a Canadian guy, um, American dude. I was probably right in my prime there uh, on a show that was one of the top tier shows in, um, in, 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 in Saskatchewan. The Rough Riders, they're the only professional team. So mm -hmm. the whole province follows that team. So we're very, very uh, popular. And so anytime a rider fan moves to um toronto or vancouver they're they're still wearing their writer stuff so we have fans everywhere so that show was actually really big to get on and it was actually it was actually fun for my day that i was there man you know you you, you mentioned something a while ago that i'd like to dig into i'm a dad I, you know you're a dad you've got you got three kids i'm a dad i've got two kids mine are seven and five two daughters um I believe, that, and, and let us know if we're wrong, but how many of your kids were born there in Canada and were any of them or just one of them? Or? Yeah. So <clears throat> it's funny because um, uh, two of my kids were born in Canada and uh, my oldest, I was part of the New York. So I moved, we moved to Canada, uh, married. We, were mar we got married in, uh, in May, or sorry, in April. We moved to Canada in May. And um, little Matt was born the following June. All right. And so, um, but I was a part of the New York Jets at the time. And so he was actually born in Massapequa in New York. Mm. And so, um, but when I was released uh, from the Jets, I immediately went back to Saskatchewan. So technically my oldest son, all he knows was Saskatchewan. Mm. That's all he, he was, he was raised there. And the other two were born there. And so those other two are actually Canadian um, with, uh, you know, they're dual citizens now. And so, yeah, they're, um, you know, they're, my kids' upbringing was mostly in Saskatchewan. They're more Saskatchewan than they are Texan. What was it like whenever you said, like, hey, we're, we're moving to, to Frisco? Like, what were their thoughts on that? And, and like, how have they adjusted? It was the, it was, it was actually the opposite. So um, my whole, my whole goal, so Matthew was going into his um, 11th grade year, right? And so uh, my daughter, Victoria, was uh, ninth grade going into 10th. And I told them, um, and I told the wife, like, let's get them through high school. And then once we're through high school, we can, we can move back, right? And my wife wanted to move back like five years ago. <laughs> okay, she was, she was ready to move back, but she, you know, we kind of went that way. What, what changed was my, my oldest son um, really likes to act. Um, he's a very, he's a, that's what he, his thing, he's acting. And uh, he did a competition in Vancouver and won a bunch of awards and um, had some interviews with some agents and almost to a person, each agent said, look, if you're American, uh, we can get you work in the U.S., you know, and some of the stuff to some of the stuff is better to be in the U.S. for. 
All right. And so we were having dinner once they came back. Uh, once they came back from that, that event, we were having dinner two days later. And I just asked the family, I said, well, what would you think if we moved back to Texas? And um, I thought I was going to hear, no, dad, I don't want to. All my friends are here. Huh? It was the exact opposite. My, my, my kids were like, yeah, let's go. Sure. Wow. Let's, let's move back. Let's move. Yeah. Where do you want to move to? And like my youngest was a little more um, hes hesitant because, um, you know, he had club basketball teams that he was really um, tight with and football teams he was really tight with. And uh, but the older two were like, no, let's go. And I thought it would be the opposite, that the high school kids would be like, no way, I'm stuck here. I want my friends. And I kind of figure out that, you know, with social media, they're just doing this to keep up with their friends. Right. They're snapping each other. It's Instagram. So you can be in Canada and still be connected. Right. Right. So, yeah, they didn't care. They didn't care. So they so because they were open to it, I'm a real estate agent. I can be a real estate agent anywhere, mm -hmm. right? And the wife already wanted to move back. So because of that, we started making plans. And, um, you know, it wasn't, you know, two, two three months. My wife had already kind of secured a, a, a position. And now it was just about when we can get back. And now I generally wouldn't advise people to move in the middle of a global pandemic but <laughs> but um uh, you know it, it happened and it's worked out it's worked out very well my kids are thriving here that's awesome that's really good to hear that's that's interesting you know i didn't even think about that but yeah being in a global pandemic in a different country that has a different healthcare system mm -hmm. we're gonna touch on that a little bit like what, yeah. what was that like you know we always hear that um that the canadian healthcare is free right it ain't free okay mm -hmm. You're paying for it within your taxes, all right? Which is fine, I, and I'm totally fine with that because I'm open to everybody getting, you know, a, a, a very general level of care to be being able to provide be provided with a general level of care. Yeah, take some of my tax, cool. I'm cool with that. Um, uh, and and ultimately, you know, a lot of the preventative care is great there. Like if I got a cough, I can just go in and doctor will see me. Like it's great. It's when you have these other surgeries where you're on wait lists, right? If you've got a knee, a shoulder, some of these things that are kind of elective or things you can kind of live with, they put you on a put you on a, a list for that, right? But um, but coming to here, well, we had to find a, uh, an insurance provider immediately, Be and it was fine because my wife's job provided provided for that. But um, now that safety net isn't there, right? And so uh, you move back here now, you got to find your insurance and make sure that you're you know, everything, your, your, your uh, eyes are dotted and your T's are crossed to make sure that you you get, you, you know, get the appropriate amount of insurance. My kids are all athletes. So a sprained ankle, a broken wrist, a, a concussion, all these things need to be able to be covered because they go and do, right? Yeah. So that was one of the main things, um, um, you know, for, for us and our families, we had to make sure that um, within the move, that that was something that we made sure that uh, we had on top of mind uh, to make sure that we were covered when we get here. Now, what was it like for you? So you were a very high profile individual in Saskatchewan and you moved down now to Frisco, Texas, where you kind of returned to uh, maybe a sense of normalcy. Yeah. So how has that been different for you personally? You know, um, it's been great. It's been, it's been great in the sense of so anonymity has been awesome, right? Yeah. Because I, I was not, I wouldn't say that I was like a super famous person, but you know, I kind of stood out there. I had a TV show there, I had a, a, a TV segment, had a radio segment. Um, you know, I, I played there, I was able to be inducted into the Hall of Honor there. So you know, I had lots of friends. And so um, I was in the community, I did charity work, like I was in the community. So I always, I always had, um, people ask me for pictures and autographs and stuff like that. And generally people are um, very respectful, but there are some people that don't care. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that part of it was kind of, was kind of um, grading for the wife over, over time, you know, sometimes just want to be us, right. Just want to have a dinner and nobody interrupt us to have dinner and um, didn't happen all the time. And um, some people aren't uh, respectful of, of privacy, but to move back, just be a regular dude. Loving it, loving it, loving it. It's been it's been good that way. I, Greg, I can tell you this story. Oh, Sammy, I can tell you this story. Look, <laughs> we first moved to Saskatchewan. Okay, so I play a year. I play a year. I do well. Go to the New York Jets. Okay, 
I play well in New York Jets. I'm not in their plans. They cut me. I move back to uh, come back to Saskatchewan. I I'm to get on the team for the playoff run. Okay, mm-hmm. we had a re- very good playoff run. When I when I came back, we were five and eight. We're out of the playoffs. We literally went on a run, won our first game in the playoffs, and we should have won another game to get to the Super Bowl, the Great Cup, mm-hmm. right? So, I'm I'm due then a contract. All right, so I'm I'm, co- I'm coming up with my contract year. So I get a bigger contract, and I said, babe, if we've got, if I'm getting paid in Canadian funds, we need Canadian bills. Mm-hmm. So, you know, mortgage, all this stuff. So it's like, we got to move to Canada. And she was like, all right, let's 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 move to Canada. So we we moved to Canada. So a few of my friends were great because as we were moving in, they some of the guys helped me move boxes in. It was awesome. I had a bunch of guys that helped me. It was super duper cold at this time. I'm still saying it was cold. But guys came to help. It was awesome. That night, that night, um, <laughs> we didn't have any of our cooking stuff out. So we went to a place called Boston Pizza, which is like pizza, but like I think it's better pizza, right? Okay. More, fam- It's more of a restaurant than just a pizza spot. Mm. So we go to Boston Pizza, and um, we order. And... Um, I told my wife, hey, look, I'm going to go talk to this manager and, I, and I'll be back. Uh, just, you know, order me a drink and, uh, and I'll be back. And so I talk to the manager, go to the washroom on there. And guy comes up to me and uh, dude, just random guy comes up to me and he sticks his arm on my sh- around his shoulder. And he's like, hey, Dominguez, you're right. You met Dominguez, right? And I go, yeah, yeah, well, I am. He goes, he goes, dude, you're awesome. I heard you just moved here. And I was like. Yeah, just moved like today. I just moved in. And then he got choked up. And he got choked up and started crying. He's like, he goes, he goes, and you're a fan. Like, he's got my arm. Like, he's got my arm. He's, his arm is behind me. And he's got me pretty good. He goes, you're a family guy. And you're in the community. And you're awesome. You're awesome. And I was like, I didn't know what to say. I was like, so this is what I said. I said, I appreciate everything that you're saying right now, but I'm just trying to pee. Can you give me like five minutes, dude? Give me like five minutes. Right? He was like, yeah, okay, man. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Like, Dog, like, that's, what, that's the stuff I'm talking about. Day one, I was there. They don't, they never, they, they never, it's a true story. It's not like a joke, right? It's such a true story. So, you know, when you talk about being famous and anonymity and stuff like that, it's going to be part of it. If you're a doctor, people are going to want to ask you about doctor stuff. If you're a lawyer, people are going to want to ask you about lawyer stuff, right? If you're a player or a former player, you're going to get the football questions and you're going to get that. It's just kind of built in. So you just got to know better, right? You just got to know that, that that's coming. I just wasn't prepared for that level <laughs> of it. You know what I'm saying? But to be back here, I'm good. Good. So you probably ran into Saska man. I, I guess that's who it was, right? <laughs> I actually did. He actually came to a game late, a little later on and was in the booth with us. Uh, it was pretty nice. cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. That's a cool story. So Matt, you know, speaking about football, one, was football always your passion? And two, when did you realize that, wow, I can make a professional career out of this sport? You know, yeah. So, you know, I want to say like, Second grade, third grade, um, I just knew that football was my thing. Like, I actually had a burn. You know, when practice was over, I had a burn until when's next practice. Like, it, I just felt like, when's our next game? You know, when when are we playing again? And I, I just knew. I just knew. And everything was the Olympics to me. I, I, I everything was competition. We play four square. I'm trying to win at four square. We play. Mm-hmm. Heads up, buns up, and trying to win at that, right? I can vouch for all that. <laughs> I'm just, and then, and then it just filtered into basketball, right? It's basketball. I'm gonna try to play basketball at my at the highest I can play. Um, but I just, I always had it in me that football was gonna be my thing, and I don't know why. Um, the good Lord blessed me with being able to catch, um, and so, you know, I had the size. Um, I was mean, and I played mean. And that I could, I, this only way I knew how to play um, um, was to be on an edge. It's the only way. And if you know me any, any outside of that, I actually am joking around and, and you know, teasing everybody and, and do stupid things. But on the court or on the football field, 
I'm I'm pretty much a jerk. You know, that's the only way you think. I I I rationalize like this: you've got these dudes, you got these alpha males who are running around hitting each other, and then those guys become uh, professionals where that's their livelihood. They get paid to do that, right? So in my brain, I'm like, man, I gotta bring everything I have to this because these other dudes, they're doing the same thing, right? And so, but I always knew, I always knew that I wanted to play football. I didn't know until my junior year in college that I would actually be good enough to, I could possibly be good enough to be a professional. Mm. My junior year in college, I was all American. And, and it wasn't something that you see out of my school. We don't really, th- we didn't throw the ball that much. And uh, Southland Conference didn't really produce a lot of receivers like that. And we didn't, like I said, we just didn't, if you don't have the opportunity, you don't really do it. And so, but my, 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 uh, my junior year, I lit it up. And then all of a sudden I'm having these, these, these NFL scouts come to my practices and come to the, to the university. And right then I was like, Ooh, I might, I might actually make it. I might be able to, to see the next level. Right. And so that was always my goal was, can I, can I get to the next level? Because from our hometown, Greg, was nobody. Nobody ever made it that far. Yeah. So I, I, my goal was I always want to be the first. Can I just be the first? Like Mason Crosby has had an a outstanding career. He's a champion. He's a champion. He's got ring, right? But he won the first. Oh, I was wow. first, right? <laughs> and so, and so, um, and uh, with the, um, um, rewind that back, I actually hurt my knee and actually coached Mason in his last year in Georgetown because I was a okay. teacher assistant and I coached. So um, there's that connection there, but I always wanted to. I always wanted to do that, and it took my junior year to be, for me to realize I think I can make it. And so that was it. It was once I around the junior year, senior year, I, I, I was fairly certain that I had I could actually go and, and play the NFL. What, what was it like when those scouts started showing up at practice and showing up at those games, and you knew you were being watched? How did mentally talk about the mental side of things? And so now you realize every game you go out there, yeah. and I've got a shot at the big time. Like that's pressure that you probably hadn't experienced before. Yeah. How'd you, how'd you work through that? You know what? It was uh, it was weird because uh, originally I would tell um, you know uh, some of my some of my, my teammates would go, "Hey man, the Ravens are here," or they would go, "They go, hey, the, the the Texans are here," or they would say something like that, and I would laugh it off and go, "No, they're here to see you," or they they're here to see the linebacker, or they're here to see. I would say I would say that because I didn't I didn't want to feel it. I didn't want yeah. that realization that no, they're here to see me. I, I, hundred percent honest. I, I, I always deflected, and the way I, the way I played was that much like in high school. If I had a hundred yards and a touchdown, I did my job. All right? It's like you can't say that I didn't help the team win. I did that. That's the thing that that I'm supposed to do. And then as a junior, I said I'm just going to do as much as possible. Let me get two hundred yards. Let me get three touchdowns. Right. Um, but it's it's really different when when you look up and the guy over there is is writing stuff down, and he's got a Kansas City Chiefs shirt on, yeah. right? It's just weird. Or you're going into your meeting and your position coach is coming out of a meeting with a guy wearing a New York Jets shirt, right? Like it's just it just feels different because at that time you know they're here to talk about you, right? Mm-hmm. They're here to recruit you, and it's you know. That, that profession has minimal amount of people in the world that can do that, right? 50 guys play on, on Sundays, 50, 30 teams, right? 32 teams, right? And so the, the amount of guys that are top tier, those jobs are minuscule, minimal, minimal of those jobs. Mm-hmm. And for a brief period of time, I had one of them, right? For a brief yeah. period of time. And for me, that was like the biggest thing is I... Uh, my mom saw me play on Thanksgiving game in Dallas. Like that was yeah. the one of the awesome that she was at the game. And coincidentally, that was the game that my I met my in-laws. My parents met my in-laws. We're at the Thanksgiving game on Dallas. We played the Denver Broncos played Dallas Cowboys 2001, I believe. Wow. wow. And that's when we first met. That's when everybody first met. But for that to be able to be a thing, that's a that's a memory of mine. It was key. I would never have been able to do that without without being able to catch a football. I just couldn't. Yeah. What were some of the things that you felt like were on top of your talent? Were also some of the like kind of the tactics or like the the tools that you use oh, to just man. get better? Look, I got a couple of them. I got two of them. So one of the main ones was I was I was a nerd in the sense of generally 
when you turn to, to, to talk to athletes, there's, um, you know, uh, guys, you know, they, they think they can go and drink all the time or do some kind of drugs or something like that. And I had seen guys in high school that were way more talented, physically gifted athletes, not make it. And because they didn't make it, I was like, this dude is that he's that fast and he's that good and he didn't make it. I damn sure can't do that because mm -hmm. he's do he did all these things and that didn't help him. I can't even do those things because I'm not nowhere near as talented as that dude, right? And so I stayed away. I stayed away. I didn't start drinking until I was 21 wow. because I didn't want the scouts to have anything about me that he's a drunk or he parties too much or anything. I stayed away from those things. Um, so I made sure that that part of of uh, my my game was clean. I made sure I didn't do anything. I was straight and narrow on that, right? Uh, one of the other things I did too was that once I signed my scholarship, I looked up who the other receivers were, right? I looked them all up and I looked up the depth chart and I cut it out. And every time I worked out, I pulled that depth chart up and I put it up on the, on the, on the mirror when mm -hmm. I lifted weights to see who I'm gonna beat out. Which of these dudes am I gonna move up on, right? And um, that, that's what motivated me to see which of these guys' job I'm about to take. Mm. I'm about to take these dudes, one of these dudes' job, I'm taking their job. And my first year was such a transition that I actually didn't play. They registered me because I, I just, I just was, the thought of college football was too big for me to go to class and to make it to practice and then the lift weights and you're doing all these things. It was, it was too much for me to get in immediately. Some kids, it's an easy transition. For me, it wasn't. So they registered me. I couldn't. But about halfway through it, halfway through the season, it clicked. It clicked. I, I realized why I was there. I realized what was asked of me. And halfway through the season, I started killing people in practice. I was like, if I'm not going to play, that's cool. I'm going to kill all these dudes in practice. This is my game day. And so scout team, I'm lighting everybody up. Everything's a touchdown. Everything's a uh, – I'm mossing everybody. Because it, it kind of clicked. Yeah. Um, but, um, but the main thing was the, the mental part of it. Right. You know, you can only do so much with your I think the thing that sets a lot of people apart is your mental game. You know, your the other part, your physical part, a lot of that's God given. God given. If I was if I was if I was if I was five eleven, I don't think I'd have made it. Not fast enough. Definitely not fast enough, right? But six three, you can be a little bit slower, right? Mm -hmm. Um but that mean edge, that's how I played. That mean edge was if it's going to be me against you i'm going full speed mm. you know so you've got to have the intestinal fortitude to stay in front of that all game because i'm going to give it right and so i i really feel that that was probably one of the main things that um um one of the main things that made me successful maybe be able to achieve some stuff um now the 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 problem the problem with that is uh, a lot of the guys including me once that part of your life is done, once football is done, once that professional part is done, it's hard to turn that off. Mm. It's hard to turn that type of aggression off. So you're trying to transfer that into different parts of your life, and it don't. It's some a lot of these portions of life don't really work. You know, to to act that way, to have that kind of behavior or habit, some of that actually doesn't help you. You know, because now you're not dealing with people that are at that level, that intensity. You're mm. dealing with people that they have this profession that they've been working at and they're kind of doing this. And then here you come, you know, with your everything. And it's a, it's an issue some, you know, sometimes. And some guys, like I said, some guys can't, you know, you've spent your whole life being this macho, go hard guy. And then now you don't have that anymore. So where's your identity? And uh, that's, I, 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 I believe a hundred percent that whenever you see someone struggle, a professional athlete struggle after his, his uh, career is done, He's got some kind of issue with his identity that he's that he's uh, he's he's searching with, he's dealing with uh, that he didn't prepare for. I mean, he's not prepared for it. He's just not, which is why I also feel like that's why you see high levels of divorce and mm -hmm. guys losing all their money and you know mental illness. I I believe a big portion of that is that we're taught to be this guy, and then when that's gone, what do I have? Right. So it was transition. That was all. I, I've been working through that transition myself. Yeah, man, that's so interesting you say that because in, in so many aspects, that attitude, that aggressive nature, that confidence is such a skill set that most people don't have that they're striving to accomplish. 
And in certain cases, so many professional athletes have that, but yet they don't have the ability to adapt and to be able to use it and use it to their benefit after they finish playing sports. And so I wonder, is there an opportunity, especially for athletes or just, just people that are really high performers? And, and I wonder with you, I know you've done a lot of public speaking in your life. Have you talked, have you talked to groups and other athletes about how you've transitioned and how you've taken kind of your mindset and switched it into real estate? And yeah. being a being a, I think in many ways it can probably be summed up like this. You grew up being a leader in your high school, your college, and then as a professional athlete and, and a figure people look to, then that goes away. How do you transition that into be a leader in your society and in your next profession? And so you have had you know, so much success in like the real estate game. Are you able to talk to other people and be able to kind of coach them or help them and give them pointers in terms of how you personally made that yeah. transition? Yeah, you know, what's funny is, is it's not really for, for me, what I find myself doing is using a lot of those principles that I had come up with professionally in football in my everyday. And then uh, as well as in real estate, um, I, I, you know, when I own my own office, we, I try to create a team, right? Mm -hmm. And then, with, well, within your team, you've got to make sure everybody's on the same page, everybody's got the same information, like it's all that. So you're always talking. You're always, mm -hmm. it's a give and take, right? And then some people aren't, they don't have it that day, but you got to pump them up to be right. ready for that day. Like it's so similar that way. Um, and, you know, also some of these things are, are, are parental, right? Like I got three kids. And so, you know, you want to be, uh, 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 to have that kind of role model to show that how, what hard work is. And, but there's empathy involved that you know, mm -hmm. some people, once again, some people don't got it or they're not there mentally to absorb what you're trying to put out there. And then I coach. I've coached actual real estate agents to to improve their uh, their personal business, uh, but I coach all my kids my kids sports too, right? And so yeah. there's just so many principles that that really flow. Um, that as long as you are like you have a, a good understanding of who you are, um, I think that there's so much that that uh, some guys can do. Um, but the key is to know who you are. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, so I want to go back to college you graduate and you have the opportunity to try out for the denver broncos so walk us through what that was like oh. you know, we watch we watch hard knocks on tv and we get a glimpse <laughs> of training camp yeah. what's training camp really like especially yeah. for a guy that's undrafted that goes in there and then freaking makes the team dude so like if they kept 53 guys i was 52.9 like that's the, I barely made it. Like I barely made it. So I got two. I got two stories. I when when I knew that I wasn't going to be a day one draft pick. I I was hoping that maybe sixth seventh round they would pick me up because um, I had the credentials. But my senior year wasn't that great. So I had my whole family over at my house or my grandmother's house um, to watch the second day of the draft, or the last day, the, the last few rounds. And so. Um, In the, the the fifth round, I get a call from the Denver Broncos, and they said, look, we're going to draft you, but probably not until round seven. And so I got this phone call in my cell phone, and everybody's quiet. The whole fa the whole family, it's like 25 people in the room. Everybody's quiet. I have this, and he goes, probably the seventh round. I was like, okay, I look forward to it. In the seventh round comes, Denver trades away all their picks for a pick the next year. <laughs> they trade all their picks for picks next year. I immediately get a call saying, okay, we're not going to pick you right now, but we're going to call you right after the draft, okay? And I go, oh, okay. Here we go. Here okay. we go. All right. Great, great, great. Cool, cool. And my agent was there. My agent was there. And my girlfriend at the time was there, who's now my wife. Uh, she was there. And they were like, it's going to be okay. Yeah, it's going to be fine. So the draft ends. Mr. Irrelevant happens. The draft ends. And literally 25 seconds after that last dude called, they called me. Now, mm -hmm. what you what you have to know is that after the draft, teams are the teams have priority free agents, right? Dudes that were good enough to be drafted, but they just didn't for whatever reason they didn't draft them. And they're trying to fill out their roster so they can have a training camp, right? So they usually spend the next three, four days just finding bodies, finding guys that they can get. So if they call you immediately after the draft, that means that you were like, you should have been drafted. They're going to draft you, right? Okay. So I didn't. I, did, I didn't get drafted. But, you know, he calls. He says, would you Matt, like to be a part of the Denver Broncos? And I go, yes. Yes. Yes, I would. 
And uh, he, he goes, okay, all right, great. And so I had the phone to my agent. He does it. And my whole family is there. And they're all quiet. They all look at me. And my mom goes, so, so how do you feel? And all I could think of in my head was, it's just, you know, got to get more hard work in. Gotta, I got to get back at it and start doing more hard work. And so everybody, you know, comes to hug me and everything. But all I could think of was my start, my, my it's just the beginning. It's the beginning of everything. Now I got to get ready for, like, I've made it. Like, there was, there was a, a part of me that felt relieved that I was going to be playing in the NFL, that at some point I'm going to have a Denver Bronco jersey and stuff on, right? right. Like, I have my, I kept my, my, uh, my, my helmet's right up there. Yeah. Mm. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, but all I could think of was if I want to make it, I got to start working because I'm not the fastest dude. I'm not the fastest dude, not the quickest guy, but if there's one thing I can control, and that's how hard I go. Right. Uh -huh. And so that night, everybody left. That night, I went on rain. I went on ran routes. So I was like, I got to get back at it. But the actual, the actual training camp experience, they couldn't mess with me, Greg. I yeah. was, I was awesome. Look. If you told me to get get you donuts, full, I got you thirteen donuts. <laughs> if you told me, if you said one time they said, Matt, go give me a, uh, uh, go give me some sunflower seeds, right? So training camp, they got all these, they got a concession stand for the players, right? Sunflower seeds, bubble gum, stupid shit like that, right? So they go give me some sunflower seeds. All right, cool. I got all the tight ends of sunflower seeds, and they give all spit cups, <laughs> right? So you can spit them in there. It's like I was the best rookie. <laughs> like, hey, rook, grab my helmet. It's okay, sir. I'm gonna grab your helmet, full. Because to me, I was like, I'm not going to give these fools any anything. ammo yeah. to do anything to me, right? I messed up one time. I messed up one time. I, I went and got chicken, and it, by the time I got back, it was cold, mm. right? I went and did the thing they wanted me to do, but the time I got it was cold. Man, I went to, I went to, I went to practice, came back from practice, um, and all my clothes that I was walking, that I came in with, were all in individual bags and were frozen. <laughs> like my shirt was frozen, my pants were frozen, my shorts, everything was frozen. as individual bags, so I had to wear my stank clothes home. Cold um, chicken, huh? Yeah, that was it. Over cold chicken, that was it. That, that's but but the truth is though, me, I was happy because I was one of them. Like I was, yeah. I was wearing Bronco stuff. Like I, I was the worst number, number forty nine. <laughs> <It's the> <laughs> that's the number you give somebody that's not going to make the team. That's the number you give them, right? But. And, and the, hey, matter of fact, um, the day that I made the team, I actually thought I didn't make the team. All right? It's a great story. I guess yeah. we got time for it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we yeah. got plenty yeah. of time. So, so at that time, um, when it was final cuts, like they're cutting people periodically anyway, right? And so, but then there's a final cut day where you're cut and you're done or you're cut and you're on practice roster. Okay? So, so we get to that day. And I feel good that I had a good good camp. I didn't play in the preseason very much because if you play a lot and you do well and they put you on the practice roster, another team can get you off the practice roster, right? Mm -hmm. So they didn't let me play, so then I didn't have film, right? So it, that was a good sign that I was going to make the team. But it's also, you know, you're risking it. Now I don't have any film, right? So that day, uh, they tell everybody, bring your your playbook, all right? And so I was all like, like I felt great. I was like, man, I had a really good camp. I thought I did awesome. And so we're all sitting there. They had a guy walk through. All right, we called him Reap. Everybody called him Reap because mm. the Reaper's coming, right? Yeah. Everybody called him Reap, black dude. He actually wore all black that day. Okay. <laughs> he actually had a button-up shirt into black slacks, a black shirt into black slacks, right? And what he would do was he'd find the aisle he was supposed to be in. He'd walk to the, he'd be counting, he'd walk to the locker. Find the locker, find the guy, says, GM needs to see you. Mm. Bring your playbook. That means it's over for you. You're done, yeah. So wow. It's over, right? So <clears throat> so it's after practice, and this is happening. That's happening. So he's walking around telling these dudes they need to see you, right? What are you and thinking right now when that's going on? I'm thinking, like, I'm actually, like, you kind of can get who the sense of the guys. They're yeah. not going to make it because – they didn't get to play. They're way on the depth chart. Yeah. Like you can kind of get an idea, and so, and so that's all. That's what's happening. So Reap comes. He comes down the other aisle, and he removes a guy, and so me and the, the so I'm with the tight ends because I'm actually a, technically a tight end, and they're over here, and uh, we're talking. We're we're actually joking around, 
because all these fools like like Matt's here, right? He's he's played through he's here, right? Mm-hmm. And it was me and another dude um who were kind of the same size, right? And uh, but I was the rookie, okay. And Reed comes around and he walks over and he comes to my locker and he looks at me and he goes, You need to bring your playbook, you know, go to the gym. And my whole life like stopped. The guys, one of them audibly gasped like a guy, not like a <gasps> like he's like, like, like it hit him, right? Yeah. And me, I was like, in my brain, I was like, No way, what? No yeah. way. But I didn't show that, but I was like, there's no way. So I reach back and what happens, what happens in that scenario is now everybody looks at you, but then they don't look at you, mm-hmm. right? So everybody's looking at you, but then like, right? <laughs> so I got my book and it's like walking the green mile, full like you're going, <laughs> yeah, like, right? So Reed, he's walking with me and I have my book. And as I'm walking through it, I hear some guys go, no way. I, I hear some dudes go, really? Like. But then I also hear some guys like, hey, me. <laughs> like, yeah, like, right. Right. And so, so I get up to the top and while I'm walking, it's the, such a defeated, like I, I felt so defeated. I felt so low. I was starting to think of what am I going to tell my mom? Like, like I thought I made this. I did what am I going to, I got to call her and let her know. And then I'm going to have that bad conversation. I got to start packing up. And I said, like, I started to have all these thoughts, right? So I go into the GM's office and he's on the phone. He's on the phone and he looks, he's on the phone. He looks at me and he, he's on the phone and he goes like this. And so I sit down and he, he finishes his conversation, puts the phone down. He goes, what are you doing here? And I go, he told, he told me to, I said, he told me to come see you. He goes, not today. You're not coming today. All right. Get the hell out of here. <laughs> and I go, wait, he goes, he goes, you're going to be on practice roster. And I go, oh, well, I'm this shit. Hey, so to me, to me, I'm like, I don't even care. You can put me on practice roster, practice roster. I don't right. even care if I'm here, right? Yeah. Because I look, I'm just happy. Once again, I just want to be the first. Yeah. I wanted to be the first, right? My goal was to make it. And and so he cut the wrong dude. Reek came down wow. and got the wrong guy. And what he was supposed to get was the other guy. Yeah, the guy that me and him were similar. Now, don't feel sorry for that dude because he went on to play for the Saints and won a Super Bowl championship as a, and he was a really good player for them, right? Yeah. Wow. But, but for a brief period of time, like I didn't make it. I wasn't there, and then and then I made it, and so I had. So then I'm I'm having. I come back downstairs, and the other guy's like, everybody livens up again. They're like, oh, okay, you, you made it. You're here. You're, you're back. back. Yeah, you're here. It's like, oh yeah. And like, so, where were um, you five minutes ago, right? <laughs> right? It's like when y'all turned y'all back on me. Like, yeah, what were you dudes? Uh, but, um, uh, you know, for me, for, for me, it was a goal just to make it, okay? I'm not going to sit here and say that I had the most amount of fun because it's, a, it, it's your job now. It's not yeah. fun. It's your job. And once it becomes your job, a little bit, you, in, a little bit comes from that that it's not the same. It ain't the same. You're getting paid for that. And you're getting paid for your time, and you're playing playing a game for it, right? But there comes a time of it that there's a that now because it's what's paying your bills, there are there are stresses about it that now comes with it. They don't tell you about that part of it, right? Mm. They don't tell you about the glamour part, right? They don't tell you about the other part. And so, um, you know, I was all and, and because, like I said, I was the last guy that made the team. Every Tuesday, they brought guys in, new guys in. To to ch- try them out to see whatever. So if you're the last guy on the roster, yeah. you're the first guy gone, right? You're feeling so heat. I, yeah, I never felt comfortable in Denver. He was like, "Oh, well, you're having to play the field." I was like, "I actually wasn't," because every day I thought I was gonna lose my damn job. Yeah. Every day. So imagine going to your job every day thinking that that's your last day. Like yeah. it was the worst feeling. It's one of the worst feelings, right? So, um, you know, but I met so many of my. I met Jerry Rice. I met Peyton Manning. I, my locker was next to Terrell Davis, who was wow. like the top dog at the time. Yeah, the like, man. You know, Rod, uh, Ed McCaffrey, who now Christian McCaffrey. Wow. I met Christian McCaffrey, like when he was yeah. a little kid. Like, like uh, you know, all these, all you know, I, I met so many guys. I was able to meet so many dudes. I played in, in Oakland. I'm a Raiders fan. I was played in Oakland on Monday Night Football. It was awesome. Um, yeah. You know, it's it's somebody. I was able to to meet so many of these dudes. I shook Tim Brown's hand, which to me as a receiver to be able to 
like I said, Jerry Rice, it was awesome. Bruce Smith blocked me. Like it was, it was <laughs> so many of those things happened. And, um, you know, I was on a, I was, uh, I beat Daryl Green on the out route. Daryl Green's one of the fastest guys Darryl ever. Green. I beat him on out route, right? <laughs> it was awesome. I, I, I had my first catch and I was blasted by Chad Brown, but mm. it was awesome. It was like, I got, I got a catch. It was awesome, right? Um, I was able to do so many of those things. And um, coming from Georgetown where no one's done it and no one had done it up until that point and to, to have that burn since like second grade, to be able to do that. The first time I ran down on kickoffs, I, I was like a kid. Like I just, I couldn't believe that I'm actually doing this and um, and getting paid and getting paid to do it. Like it was awesome, man. It was it was really awesome. So Well, Matt, I, I, I'm monopolizing my time. I know Sammy's got some questions here, but sure. I've, got, I've got to share this. Um, you were the first to make it. And oh. I never forget, I was in Cameron, Texas at my aunt and uncle's house on a Sunday morning, or I guess Sunday afternoon, technically. And we watched you on the Denver Broncos. And I'll never forget where your name came on the screen. Mm. And my brother and I were jumping up and down the living room. We were like, yeah, <laughs> just going nuts because you are from Georgetown, Texas. And people from Georgetown, Texas, don't do anything, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. at least that was our mindset at the time, sure. right? Sure. And it was such a cool moment to see you on TV in an NFL game wearing a Denver Broncos uniform. It's something I'll never forget. It was a really, really cool moment. And I guarantee you there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people from our class and from our town that had the same experience. Notice I said hundreds and not a thousand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There were several so hundreds then. of people. Yeah. Yeah, there was hundreds back then. Yeah. But man, it, it was a really, really cool moment. It was very special. That's awesome, man. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, it it was it was one of the things that uh, you if ever if you have life goals, mm -hmm. that was one of my big ones, and I was able to check it off. Yeah. There's so many things. It amazes me, like when you talk to former players, and we've had the the good fortune to, to meet a few in our journeys. Um, but to hear them talk about their like favorite plays or like this one thing that happened to them. And it, it could be 20 years ago, you know, they're like, yeah. Oh, it was this down. It was this time. It was that thing. Do you have any of those moments in your life, be it from the NFL, from the mm -hmm. CFL that really sticks out in your life. And then also, I know y'all won the great cup, right. In, mm -hmm. in 2007. So Maybe, maybe tell us a little bit about that, your favorite moment, and then talk a little bit about winning the Grey yeah. Cup when you hit that yeah. pinnacle of success. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So one of my one of my one of my favorite moments um, was I had I had torn my knee, right? In uh in 2003, I had torn my my ACL. Hmm. And um and I came back in my first touchdown I scored after that. For whatever reason, felt so exhilarating. It was just a go route. And I out jumped a guy for the for the ball, and I landed. And to hear the crowd yell um, was was awesome because I remember the low point. I remember not being able to walk. I remember my leg being bandaged. I remember me being crying and sobbing, and feeling like you know I'm never gonna get back. And then catching that pass and feeling all the work it took to get back to that mm. point, um, the exhilaration of that, right? It was just, it was kind of validation of all the work that, that I had put in. And um, and it was it was an excellent feeling. You know, and I, hell, I think we even lost the game, but mm. for me, that catch was kind of a validation. And I, I remember that clear. There's a few, there's a there's several, there's several of, of things like that. I remember before a game, I told, um, we were playing Hamilton. And I told one of my ex-teammates who was now a broadcaster, before the game, we're just messing around, just catching. And he goes, how do you feel today? I go, look, this is how good I feel. After my second touchdown, I'm going to throw you the ball. <laughs> he goes, ooh, I like it. He's like, ooh, I like that. Greg, don't you know I scored two touchdowns? Yeah. And the touchdown, the second touchdown was they had a, the, so a bunch of announcers that are in the end zone. Right. So I scored and went over and threw him the ball <laughs> on live TV yeah. after I called that shit the, yeah. the game. It was crazy. It's a true story that really happened. And who calls who says I'm gonna score two touchdowns and I'm gonna give you the second ball? Like I could yeah. score on the other side. I could right. score on the other end. But I scored right there and they would give it to him. Like well, it was knowing crazy. me like like I know you, you would have scored on the other end and you would have ran your ass all the oh, way. Oh yeah, I'm gonna get all the way. I was gonna get, 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 get that ball. 
Um, in 2007, we won the Great Cup. I actually was leading the CFL in, in yards, mm. uh, and I hurt my knee again. And so I was not unable to play it. So, so I was actually mad at the world that I wasn't able to play it. But what I ended up doing was kind of changing myself and making myself a coach. We had a very good team. And so I was just kind of, you know, provide levity. You know, I'm a veteran, you know, try to help the guys wherever I could fit in. And um, um, one of my really good friends in that game, um, he runs at the very end of the game. He runs for a first down. And just by just by timeouts, just by time on the clock, the game was over. And when that happened, when he runs for the first time down and they can't stop the clock and the clock, you, I, like right when he runs for that first down, I, I just started crying. I yeah. like, oh, my God, we've won this thing. Because at that point, Saskatchewan had won a championship like 20 years. Yeah. Like 20 years they hadn't won a championship. And for, for me personally, you know, I had been a professional, but I hadn't I didn't win a championship in college or high school, didn't win one in college, didn't win one of the Broncos. Like that's my championship, you know? And I didn't care if I wasn't playing. Like I helped us get there, you mm -hmm. know? And yeah. so and so um the exhilaration, because you remember that you remember the the journey. You remember the journey to the 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 end cap of that, mm -hmm. right? Um, you start off the training camp with all these guys. You're practicing together. You're playing all these games. You're traveling. You, these guys are like family because they're you're with them almost more than you are with your family. Right. And then for the culmination to be that you're the best that year, that was awesome. Yeah. It, was, it was awesome. And so for me, um, uh, for me that. 2007 Grey Cup was, uh, it, it meant so much, uh, even because, you know, regardless of me being able to play or not, uh, because, you know, you set out goals, you set out goals, nobody wants to lose their last game, you want to lose, you want to win your last game, mm -hmm. right? And we were so good, and some of the guys that I was, was, was playing with were a little long in the tooth in their careers and hadn't had success, and for us to get them a championship, it was awesome, it was awesome, and then, um, a little extra to that, um, we beat our arch rivals in the championship game. So that was even awesome. Yeah. But um, no, it was good. It was good. You know, I got a ring and um, I, I cherish that ring. That's amazing. Yeah. That's an awesome story. So, Matt, what was it like your pro football player and your dad? Mm -hmm. So how do you balance that? Because you mentioned you're on the road so much. You're traveling throughout you know, the CFL, you've got a wife at home, and then you've got three kids. Yeah. Like, just talk, talk a little bit about what that was like. You know, it's tough. It's tough. Once again, like I said, they don't ever show you, they don't ever show you the challenging parts. They only show you the good stuff, right? And one of the things that's tough is, so you practice all day, right? Like, you're, at a, you're either in a meeting or on the football field, right? You come home, and you got a two-year-old son that wants to throw the football. Mm -hmm. Like, fuck, I've just been throwing the football for like three hours, dude. Mm -hmm. But you've got to do that because they haven't seen you all day. You're a dad, right? And so you're trying to balance all this. Uh, the travel's a little different um, because uh, CFL, they're not like the NFL. The NFL has their own, own planes. CFL, you fly commercial. So you're wherever you go, you're usually staying the night and then flying back, right? Um, there's a portion of it that, that you have to manage. Like anything else, you have to manage your time and yourself. Um, just like the NFL, you know, the, I got interviews, I got to do stuff, from commercials. I, I've got to take pictures, places. We got to go say hi and, and do some charity work. Like those are things that are demanded of your time. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to manage, you've got to manage it uh, well. I think I, I, I like to think I did a good job with, um, with my kids. My kids were, were really young. And so as much of the things that I could bring them with, I, we brought them, my wife and I brought them. Right. And we were able to to do some of that. Um, but I don't think that I would have. I, it's not I don't think I wouldn't have been able to be as much in the community and do as much as I was able to do without my wife. Mm -hmm. She Jennifer did so much with the kids. She was able to um, um, you know, make sure that uh, they had a, a normal as much normal as a family life as, as, as they, they could. Um, you know, being a being a player's a player's wife, you know, there's that. You know, there's always that. Did he get hit too hard? Did he get hurt? There's always that in the background, right? Mm -hmm. um, um, but 
you know, it's it's always cool on the back end that the game ends and your family comes up to you and they all got your jerseys on. You, like it's a it's a cool feeling that way too, right? So you just have to manage it the best you can. Um, but um, if you keep them first, I think that ultimately, um, you know, you, you can make it work. You know, what, what I like what you said about that is you talked about how you would try to bring your kids and you would try to incorporate them into the things that you were doing. Hmm. And I hmm. feel like today, um, with, whether you're an accountant or whether you manage some store or whatever you do, there's always a challenge of what people say is work-life balance. Sure. And I think one thing that we're starting to see success in is when people start incorporating work-life integration. Yeah. And so bring your kids, expose them to that thing. Yeah. You know, growing up as a child, I had no idea what my dad did in his office because I never saw it. Yeah. How yeah. valuable could it have been back then, which that wasn't part of, of our culture, is to let kids see that type of thing. Yeah. And I think Absolutely. nowadays that's a really cool thing to be able to expose our kids to yeah. what the real world of, of a professional career or your job looks like. So yeah. I love hearing you say that. And I think that's something that people listening right now, I might challenge them to think about. Whether you've got to work at home or you've got to work at the office, how can you bring your kids along with that? Yeah, and I think I think we and, and I think that ultimately we we don't give like you got to know your kid by the way you got to know your child. But yeah. I think that I think that um, you know we don't give them enough credit. Kids are resilient; they're flexible. They don't know any Absolutely. better, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so they don't know any different. If you take them someplace, um, you know, you you have some, you know, you have you have the talk with them. Hey, we're not going to do this. They don't know any different. Yeah. You know, they 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 you you're 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 shaping that. Uh, you're shaping that experience for them. And so we just felt, I just felt like if I want to see my kids today, they have to come with me. So yeah. let's go. Yeah. yeah. I Like I mentioned, I'm a dad and I, I try and always focus a lot on, on like how to integrate our kids and what we're doing. So we take them everywhere we can all the time, but yeah, it's some, it's funny. Greg, you, you remind me of a story whenever I was younger, because my parents both worked for a chemical plant. Mm -hmm. down in south texas and i remember they had bring your kid to work day and uh you know my dad was a mechanic and my mom was a, a different type of mechanic she worked on like like little instrumentation gauges and clusters and that kind of stuff and so i you know i never knew what they really did i mean my dad worked on cars sometimes but the opportunity to go and see them and in, in their their workforce and talking to their friends you know they're showing you off to everybody right because of course you know yeah. oh yeah i've seen pictures you're this big and all they're, that kind they're of stuff. talking about you they're having stories about you yeah yeah they're yeah really and, awesome. and it was a couple you know I, I think i got to do it like two or three times before that aged out of it or whatever it was but yeah it was pretty unique so i can imagine walking out there in the field and, and, and taking a look and seeing that you know dad's out there dominating against some of the other guys you know and and, and doing well yeah, it was cool. It was cool. I, like I said, that was, um, you know, for, for that part of my life, it was good to be able to share that with them. Well, man, you know, now that you're back in Frisco and uh, Frisco, Texas, and you talked about when we first started the show that you're, you're really involved in youth sports with your kids. Yeah. So I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how that's important to you. And part two of that question is, what is it like for your kids playing sports knowing that their dad was a professional athlete do, do you feel yeah. like they do they have pressure because of that yeah. talk, talk us through that <clears throat> i know that um, i know that my oldest who's named after me mm -hmm. um had pressure in saskatchewan because you're named matt dominguez and you know you see him they're like well do you play football mm -hmm. you, do you do you love football right and he, he didn't care about football mm -hmm. yeah and i'm and i'm totally fine with that actually you don't want to run around hitting people. You don't have to run around hitting people. It's totally fine with me. Um, but the in terms of my kids, my kids feeling some pressure. Here's the pressure that I apply to them. Right? Is I know what it takes. I now know what it takes. I've made it. Up, I've made it mm. to the professional leagues. I know the sacrifice that it takes. How hard you have to go. I know that when you're tired, you're the one that's got to motivate yourself. Right? So. When my kids are pissy and they're moaning and they're being whatever, I'm the wrong guy to bring that to you because I know what it takes, right? Greg, I'm the first one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? The first one to make it at Georgetown, Texas, right? My wife is also, my wife was an also, she was also an all conference um, um, track, track star. So she knows what it takes too. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for my kids, you know, they've, they've, got, they've got a good resource at home. But, but we're not gonna let them get away with this lazy stuff because if this, if your, if your spoken goals are these, 
then your actions have to match that, right? And so that's what they got on that part of it, right? That's the, yeah. the, the, that that's what they're living with. Okay, mom and dad both know how to do it. You might want to pay attention. You might want to listen, right? Um, I I always found it was uh, um, I didn't have my dad coach me, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I enjoy coaching. I enjoy coaching my kids. I think it's a way for me and my kids to spend time together. Actually, if I'm being honest, we're able to actually spend time and compete, learn them, uh, teach them to compete. But the youth sports portion of it is there are so many things that sports provides for your kids that if you have kids, I tell people, put them in sports because it teaches you leadership. It teaches, it teaches you uh, how to serve. It teaches you adversity. It teaches, it teaches you how different personality types. Of course, it gives you, gives you stress. It teaches you um, um, how to win. It teaches you how to lose. And uh, it teaches you how to make, improve yourself, right? So there's all these facets that that um, by by working hard and seeing seeing what your hard work produces and what it doesn't produce, like all those things matter, right? And so I've I've wanted to be a part of that for my kids all the way through their process and get them through high school. All right, all right, coach, it's your now they're yours. But until then, I'll I'll keep coaching. I think they'll have a really good shot at uh, doing well once they get to that next level, whatever that may be, and take them just because of the grit, determination, the way that you've you've talked about the the mindset that you had, um, you know, pushing them like that, talking to them, showcase. I love what you just said, and, and it's going to mess up one of my things that I'll have to say later on. But just like if if your spoken goals are X, then your actions have to be X. I just I yeah. love that. Like yeah. right there, that's a quote right there. That, need that on a T-shirt tomorrow yeah, yeah it's exactly right i mean you tell I have, i've got you know in, in coaching kids i've got kids who are like coach i'm gonna go d1 coach i'm gonna do it like you play too many video games that's mm -hmm. not gonna get you to d1 right like like or you eat terrible you don't sleep you know you don't practice like all these things like if you want to do this cool great let's try but you need to start doing these things nick saban's got a great quote he says if you he says essentially uh you know, if, if you want to be great, you essentially don't have choices because it takes what it takes. Mm -hmm. And that's what it is. It, it essentially takes what it takes. If you want this, you got to start doing things to get that. And that means that if you don't go to that party, you got to go to that party. You got to be prepared for practice. Mm -hmm. If you've got to be mm -hmm. athletically eligible, you got to do things to be like you don't have choices. It takes what it takes. Right. Right. So. so that's that was my thing is what I try to teach my, my teams that I coach is that give me the effort, give me all your effort, and we'll work on the little the little in intricacies of it. Well, Matt, I love what you've been saying because literally everything that you talked about, how sports can provide those attributes, you can apply to every meaningful aspect of life, from our professional work to our families to our communities to just how we treat ourselves. And uh, I think you're dead on when you talk about that. And something that Sammy and I are passionate about, and we talk about this often, are sacrifices. And to do anything worthwhile, you're going to have to sacrifice things. And it's hard. But until someone really, truly understands that and is willing to actually put those sacrifices in to accomplish what they want to do, they're never going to get past the starting line. And so that, that was just, I just wanted to make that comment because... Um, what you just said, I think, was was really, really powerful. Mm -hmm. And it even got my mind thinking. And and here in just a second, we're going to come to some takeaways. And I'll be damned if, like, I'm going to have a hard time coming up with three to, to, to share. Yeah. Um, but I, I just wanted to just say that, Matt. I, I really appreciate what you said here. Question for you, though, as we start kind of getting into the fourth quarter of this episode, sure. I'm curious, what does sports look like for you these days? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. Well, um, up until up until we moved here, I was still I was still competing. I was still playing ball. Uh, I was still in a master's league. Now, now I'm the old guy league, right? The forty and above league, right? Um, I was still competing at a high level. I was still doing very well. Um, but I found I found myself now making business decisions. Like mm -hmm. I don't want to recover for four days after a game. You know, I want to be I want to be just enough shape. So I lift weights and I and I still work out and. I, I maintain myself, but I want to be in just enough shape to scrimmage with my son's 13-year-old team, mm, right? Okay. So I can scrimmage with them, and we're cool. And I don't struggle for four days, right? I just have a scrimmage, and I'm good. 
And so that's kind of that's kind of what it is for me now. Um, I may I may do the uh, the five k periodically. Um, COVID has kind of killed a lot of these things that um, you know the mm-hmm. you know the, the big events that we were able to do and stuff like that. But you know the wife and I will go out and we'll go for a run together, and so that's pr- that's pretty much the extent of it. Um, but I haven't been recruited to play anything, so we'll see. Well, I'll share this, Matt. So you're talking to two guys who live within a radius of about 20 minutes from you. <laughs> so, uh, one, we've gotten big into mountain bike riding over the last year and a half. Okay. So we may have to potentially expose you to this sport to see if it could be something you're interested in. Okay. You're also talking to individuals that for several years were the co-captains of the Frisco Throwbacks which was one of the most dominant basketball teams in like the lowest league you could possibly sign <laughs> up for in Frisco basketball. Love it. Um, Love although it. We, although we did get stuck playing against Del Harris and a group of his Texas legends, which that'll be another podcast for another time that right. may have not gone so well. Uh, yeah. But dude, we, we got to get you uh, somewhere. We got to get some ball going. We got to get you on the, on the mountain bike trails or dude, hey, yeah. we run all the time. Let's go yeah. do a 5K. Yeah, I'm, I'm all for it, especially hooping. I'm all for it. Look, I played it at the elite level till two years ago, and I got tired of chasing 20-year-olds. I'm just tired of them. I'm not there anymore, right? So, hey, if we want to play a lower division, I'm in. Nice. Well, the other thing that we've got to pull off is, and you may, may or may not remember this, Matt, but I think it was probably our junior year going into our senior year of high school, you and I played on a summer league team together. And in one of those games – I steal the ball and uh, go down for a fast break. You're ahead of me. And literally, like we had planned this out, but I come running up, I jump up, you grab me by the waist and just <laughs> throw me. Now, for people that are watching at home, like I'm 5'5 five five on like my tiptoes, right? So Matt gives me this throw and I'm sort of like Dominique Wilkins. I come like windmill style, throw it down, break the rim down. Well, we got a technical foul because apparently you're not allowed to actually throw a player in the throw, air. Throw a guy up there, yeah. <laughs> you're not allowed yeah. to do that. So yeah. the point didn't count, but the place went nuts. Yeah. And my parents said there was a woman that was in front of them watching that apparently had, like, looked down to, like, get something out of her purse and looked up only to see me flying through the air <laughs> and dunk. And my parents said she had a conniption fit because she just thought <laughs> she saw – like yeah. Michael Jordan reincarnated yeah. in my body, like go happen from the free throw line. So thank you for helping yeah. me have my only in-game dunk that hey. I had in my entire life. Hey, I'm glad I was a, a small part of that. I was glad <laughs> I was a small part of that. I can imagine, I can imagine what people would think seeing you flying through the air with the ball. <laughs> like I can only imagine. But I remember that. That was actually pretty good. We were actually pretty solid team. Yeah, so we it was were. actually pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> funny. We're old, man. We get old. <laughs> that was probably 25 years ago yeah oh man it's hilarious <laughs> well matt and this has been such an honor to uh to get to know you through this podcast and i like i said I, i've heard many 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 stories throughout the years i've known greg uh just about the antics and the the in classroom uh yeah, we didn't get fun some of that. Bit we didn't of get any of that that was good though we didn't yeah, get right, good yeah. got the pop and edit that out right? yeah right. yeah um, but this is the part of the show where we kind of start winding it down. Like Greg mentioned in the fourth quarter here, we have two, two questions that we've asked every single guest. Uh, and so we'll, we'll have two different ones and then we'll move into some actionable tips and takeaways and some, some comments that we had there. But so one of these first questions, in addition to everything that we've talked about um, so far, what was the first thing that entered your mind when you asked, when we asked you this following question? So what is your favorite actionable tip, method, routine, or like a lesson in terms of self-development and growth that you can share with us and share with the audience? I would say that to always bring your effort, okay, it is damn near the only thing that you control. You control you, right? And so uh, one of the things I've I tell my my players and my kids is um, you don't control how people react. You don't control you know exterior um, forces, but you control you. And you know if you're having an issue with um, you know, a relationship, well, where are you at with that? Where's your effort with that? You have an issue at work, well, where's your effort with that? Right? If you bring your effort 
you know, you'll you'll achieve what you need to achieve because you're controlling that. And even if it doesn't end up up the way that you expected it to, you've now you can say it on the back end, I did the best I could with I did the most I could, right? Because you brought it. And that's the when it comes to actionable, that's it. Where's your effort at? That's what that's what I always say. Where's your effort at? You know, did you get up early? Did you go hard? Did you focus in? Did you do the extra? Like, where's your effort? Because the, the things that we like and love and enjoy, we're all in, right? We, we give it all. And so if, you are, if you're ever lacking in some area, that's the first thing I say, well, where's your effort? I love it. That's, I think now more than ever, that is something that a lot of people need to hear. And I can't wait to share that with more people because a lot of people are really needing to hear that right now. Yeah. So Matt, you're probably familiar with the question that you heard often is if you could go back in time 10 years ago and talk to yourself, what you, what would you say? Yeah. We're not, we're not going to ask you that question. So we're going to reverse it. So let's just say the three of us have a time capsule that we're going to bury and you can write yourself a piece of advice that in 10 years, we're going to dig up and you can read to yourself. What advice would you give yourself 10 years from now? 10 years from now? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that, I think that, you know, I think it would probably be something to the effect about being a good husband and being a good dad mm -hmm. is to reflect on those things. So many times we get going and we just go, 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 go. And you never are in the moment. You're, yeah. you're just doing, and you're never right here. You're setting something else up for next week or tomorrow for later on today. You're never in that actual moment. And I'd like to think that in 10 years from now that I would be able to reflect back and to see that uh, that I was good as a, as a dad. I was around as a father yeah. uh, and I was a good husband. I'd like to think that in 10 years from now, I could reflect back and, and you know take some stock into what I was able to do. So I think that that's probably what it would be. It would be to, to actually, you know, people say smell the roses. Mm -hmm. They're really saying it's slow down, right? Yeah. Slow down and be, it's really what they're saying. And I think that as guys, and as men, we don't really do that enough. And so yeah. that's probably what I would say. That's probably what I'd say to myself. Man, that, that almost opens me up to go on a whole different tangent. Um, and I'll pull it back a little bit, but I love what you just said there. Because while I believe that, yes, we should have a sharp eye to the future. I'm, I mean, I'm one of the most passionate people you'll find about setting goals and planning and going after that. However, whether you look at philosophy, religion, or science, all the research shows that people that live a life of joy are present in the moment. Yeah. So yes, we learn from our past, we yeah. plan for our future, but we've got to focus on now. And if you live too far in the past, that's when you become depressed. And that's where all those, those, uh, those toxic elements really take hold. Yeah. If you're too far into the future, that's where anxiety and fear live. When you can focus on where you're at now in the present, that's where you have the impact. That's where we're living. And man, that is that is some wisdom right there, my friend. I love that you said that. Um, and that kind of is a good transition into the final um, piece of this show. This is my favorite part of the conversation tonight. This is where Sam and I will share with you three takeaways that we have from this conversation. Okay. So Sammy, do you, do you want to ping pong back and forth? Yeah, let's do that. It's, it's, and, this is always tough too, because I mean, there's like a note, you know, notepad full of notes and, and everything. And they yeah. would drag out. It's, it's always tough. So we're going to limit it to three, though. I know it's very tough. And Greg cheats all the time, but you know, we're going to do three. I'll Greg, try to you, keep it three. You want me to go first, Greg? Yeah, you go first, bud. All right, I'll take, I'll take the first one. So it's something that you, you talked about really early was uh, it was very motivational uh, to me. And it was a motivational mindset that you used. But you said in, in not so many words that you used practices as your game day. Mm -hmm. Like you, you flipped that mindset where that was one of my faults when I was younger and playing sports. I played football, basketball, baseball, and track uh, in high school. And I played them all well. But I remember like living for those game days. I did well in practice, but I lived for the game days. Now, how good could I have been had I lived for those practices? you know, and use that every day. I think that's a very powerful statement. I think more people should, should do that no matter what it is. You should practice as your game day. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, and, and just as a, in a physical, in a physical element to that, 
I didn't have a game day because I wasn't playing. They they, oh, yeah. they registered me, right? So then I was so and the other part of that was that, you know, technically you practice in football, you practice four times and then there's a game. Mm -hmm. So there's there's way more practices than there are the games, right? So if you if you if you maximize those, then the games are easy, right? That's right. kind of how I was a little that's how I look at it. Yeah. That's amazing. That's that's a great mindset. Well, Sammy, you stole one of mine. I'll just go ahead. <laughs> that was one that I had written down. Um, but the other thing that I love about that is that's the exact mindset that we should be applying to our lives today, regardless of sports right. and everything that we do. Um, Matt, I love when you shared the story about you went and put everybody on the depth chart. <laughs> and then yeah. on your mirror, you put how you're going to take them down. And that yeah. was your motivation to work hard. And that's the same type of mindset and the same type of application that we should be applying to all of our goals. And so your work ethic in terms of how you approached um, your career and how you've approached doing things for your family, how you approached your real estate, it just, it just shines through everything that you do. And that's inspiring. Hmm. And I, 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 even for me, who's somebody who is extremely goal oriented and extremely big on taking action, that really spawned some ideas in my mind about how I can even get a little bit better in that. So, man, whether it's using your mirror, write down your goals and freaking go after them. Love that. Absolutely. And you know what? I still do that. If, I, if we had a shot of my mirror, I have all my goals on my mirror so that mm. I see them every day, brushing my teeth. I see my my, my individual goals. And they're even split up into the, um, uh, this week, this month, and this year. Wow. Yeah, see, so I have the same thing, but I have it on an Excel spreadsheet that I pull through <laughs> okay. and go through. But yes. I'm going to have to take my mirror and I'm going to have to go yeah. and do a little bit of work on that. I like right, dry erase, baby. Dry erase is good. Yeah. Same thing I have. Yep. I do it with my kids too. I, and yeah. so we used to do it right across the bottom where the kids, mm -hmm. then they'd always get it messy with toothpaste. And all that <laughs> <stuff>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. So the second one that I took back, uh, it's hard to choose because there's so many I can go with, but. Hopefully you won't steal my last one, Greg. So I'm going to, I'm going to leave that one for, for my last one, but All right. it's you control how hard you work um, is what you mentioned. And then it pairs nicely with uh, always bring your effort. It's the only thing you can control and you control you. I think that again, I, I mentioned this whenever you said earlier, but more <clears throat> people need to hear that because I think more people are waiting for other people to give them the handout, the help up, whatever it is. There are times when that is needed. But there's yeah. also a lot of times where you control it and you control how hard you work and you got to show yeah. up. I had just a, just a brief one. If you have a, 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 I was coaching a girls team and we were playing against the team and um, um, they were very good. Uh, the, the one, their best player was a post player. Mm -hmm. I had my post player front them. And I said, you fight, you better be in front of her. Cause she, so if she gets the ball, it's going to be, so she fought, they were all fighting. There was always aggressive. She was always fighting to get in front. And at the end of the game, we, we won significantly um we eliminated that that player because my player gave me everything mm -hmm. what she had she gave it to me at the end of the game that other player went up to my player and said you're way too aggressive you're way you're out of control this is just i, I can't believe that you played like that and my player briefly had her head down as we were leaving walking through the parking lot she's i said what did she tell you she goes she said i was out of control and then i was like and i said don't worry about that okay She's got to get on your level. She's mm -hmm. trying to get you down to her level. No, you have the effort. She's got to get up to here to you. And that's why she took an L because mm -hmm. she's not willing to give what you were willing to give. Right. And so that's, that's, that's going to be chapter four of one of my books, but, <laughs> but that right there was, was what I, I teach it, but I actually do it. Right. And so, and so from that, from that one, I think that the team, the team really could see that literally you see someone that's willing to give. And someone that wasn't willing to give, right. and what the what the the, the uh, uh, what what it equaled, right? Well, now that's a perfect transition into my second takeaway. So I love when you share the story about teaching your kids about all these positive attributes, and when they're whining, when they're feeling with their heads down, or they want to complain, I'm not the person to bring that to. <laughs> I love that because here's the reality: as adults, we live, and I'm just going to say it, we live in a soft society. We live in a society that when people fail, make mistakes, um, you know, quit, oh, it's okay. We, 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 try, we try to just baby people too much. Well, now, I will always say we need to lead with humbleness and kindness and encouragement and positivity, but you also have to hold people accountable. You have to push people, and you have to help people determine how to grow their grit. Yeah. And 
you stand firm in that. Yeah. And I hope that's going to be something that people listen to that realize in our lives, we have got to stop letting people get away with so much. We've got to hold people accountable and we've got to encourage and push people to the maximum potential that they possess. Yeah. Love on both sides of that, that, on both sides of that, Greg, you've got to be, and this is going to be cliche, but you've got to be um, comfortable being uncomfortable, right? Uh, both, uh, both as the pusher. Yeah. yeah. Both as the guy that's pushing people, but as the receiver, like, you know, I'm not, you don't get better. You don't get better doing the same thing in my little mold that I'm happy with. Mm -hmm. You, you don't improve that way, right? You've got to get out there and, and, and do stuff or, or you got to help someone get out there and, and do a little bit, right? So that's a that's a, a super cliche, but it's the truth is yeah. you have to be comfortable in that, right? Yes, Gr grow, growth is awesome. Growth is often accompanied with pain, yeah. but that pain is what gets us to where we need to go. And you're exactly right. When you can become comfortable in that uncomfortability, that's when the sky becomes the limit. Yeah, okay. absolutely. I absolutely agree. And last one, toughest one to do, but you actually said it twice in, in two different ways. You talked about remembering the journey after your, after your uh, ACL and then catching that first, was it the first touchdown? Right? First touchdown first catch, yeah. yeah. Um, you talked about you, that was what you remember was the, was the work that you put in to get back from that injury to there and then i can't help but think that you were remembering all those times from the day you second grade and you said i'm going to be the first i can imagine you looking back and reflecting upon all of that to say like here i am again i'm, I'm back at it because you even said that too reflect on being a good dad and a husband and just reflecting in general but remembering that journey i think that we all need to do that because that's a lot of effort and there's a lot of wisdom in thinking about that and remembering on those times yeah ab absolutely and I, I just think that i just think that um it's okay it's okay to self-scout a little bit to get a little reflection to be happy with your journey um and, and too many times i think that we're um uh, we're not able to do that and so take some time be happy with, with what's going on here be yeah. in the be in the present yeah mm -hmm. yeah i love that and, and I'm also going to go back to something you said from elementary school when you talked about I had a burn. I had a burn for football. I had a burn for this purpose, for this passion. And it's evident that you carried that throughout this entire conversation and everything that you've done and what you're doing today. And one of the things that Sammy and I talked about recently with another guest on this show is like your why. And what, what when you wake up in the morning, what excites you? You know, what is your purpose? And I think all too many times as adults, we think about what we feel like we have to do. We feel like we have these responsibilities that other people think we're supposed to do. Mm -hmm. But what is your burn? Mm -hmm. And what's stopping you from going after it? And whether you're a child, a teenager, an adult, or man, you're, you're getting old and you're about to hit the grave. Yeah. I don't think we should ever stop going after our burn. And so yeah. man, that, that just inspired me, man. And I, I appreciate that story. Yeah, absolutely. I, I just think that, you know, there's a, uh, the, the, the guys that, that um, you've all met people or you've heard of somebody that they quit the workforce and then they, their health deteriorated, yeah. right? They, like they, 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 they were done, right? I just think that we're built for a purpose and, and um, you know, everybody's at their own time and at their own speed, but you still have to be trying to accomplish, right? Mm -hmm. Go, you know, do, right? And, um, and um, so when you wake up, you got stuff to do. This ain't this ain't chill time, right? Let's yeah. let's do right. And while we're doing it, we're enjoying what we're doing. Right? So I totally that's that's just kind of how I feel. And and uh, you know if that is going to help somebody do them, then great. Because I think that you know if you can self reflect, get your own effort going, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. Yeah. You'll you'll wake up with that with that key every time. That's amazing feedback right there. I mean, I think people can just take that snippet of the whole show right there. It just, <laughs> just sums up right there. Matt, it's, that's been amazing. Everything, like we said, I mean, we've got notes on notes on notes and uh, we can probably do this all night. But, you know, one of the things that we'd love to be able to do is have you come back because I think we just scratched the surface mm -hmm. uh, of who you are, what you do, 
the the level of effort the level of commitment the stories that you have and you know i would love to continue on this conversation oh, wait, oh we i got a lot of stories <laughs> <laughs> some of those i'm sure that we could take them offline too and, yeah uh, absolutely absolutely Greg's got someone. some of those <laughs> yeah right yeah um but we want to number one say we appreciate you coming on the show number two is thanks for sharing uh, um, enormous amounts of value that i think the the viewers are going to get and then this is the time now that we want to give you that opportunity to do those shameless self promotions. Like, where can people find you? What are you working on? Like, how can people get in touch with you? That kind of stuff. Yeah, um, I'm in Frisco area. Uh, I am a real estate agent with uh, Keller Williams, the uh, the Christy Cannon team. Just find us. Just type in Christy Cannon team, Matt Dominguez. You'll find me. Um, and uh, I'm online. Um, got Facebook. I'm Facebook friends with almost everybody. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm just a dad. You know, I, I coach at um, in Plano, uh, push uh, basketball, I coach my uh, my daughters, my son's team. So if I'm if I'm not selling houses, I'm with them. Nice. And then um, and last, I just want to give a shout out to my family, because without these guys, my wife and my kids that, um, that I do everything for, um, I, that's kind of my purpose. They're my why. And so I just want to give a shout out to them, too. Love it. Well, Matt, we'll have to do this offline. So we all need to go grab some drinks. And then I think eventually we'll, we'll get a live podcast together once we get yeah. past this COVID-19 yeah. chaos. Yeah. And that's where we'll really have a good time. So awesome. Um, but with that, for everybody watching at home, if you want to connect with Sammy and I in the pursuit of growth, go to our website, livetpg.com, or you can type in the pursuit of growth.com. You can check out our One Minute Matters blog that goes out every single week. You can check out other episodes of the Pursuit of Growth show, and you can buy, shameless plug, our book, The Pursuit of Growth, and literally change your life in a week of reading. Uh, Matt, it's been so much fun, dude. You're amazing. This has been a blast. And yes, we're going to do this again soon. Awesome, guys. I am I am open anytime. All right. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you so much again. And with that, Greg, it's been fun, man. Great job. All right. The TPG. Peace. Thank you.